Fanalytics with Mike Lewis. Hey, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the Fanalytics Podcast. I'm Mike Lewis, and I am joined by Doug Battle. Doug, how you doing? College football in it, Doug. You know what? This is this is the time of year of sports where it's almost. I'm almost feeling overloaded. Like I can't quite keep up, and I, that that might be a little bit strange since baseball has now concluded. But I feel like we're kind of getting to the nitty gritty of college and pro football, and then you throw in the NBA and college basketball. Certainly there's a lot of, a lot of games and Hey, as we were waiting to start to tape today, the USA tied Wales one to one. I don't really know what that means, but I think it means now that if the U S loses to England, they then have to beat Iran by a lot of goals to advance to the second round of FIFA. Doug, we're not going to talk a lot about soccer. We can talk about <laughs> soccer fandom, but we're not going to embarrass ourselves, okay? I appreciate that, Mike. Yeah, there's a new wrinkle. It already felt like, you know, I'm having to keep up with who's doing what in the NBA. Apparently, the Utah Jazz are still top of the Western Conference despite trading away their two all-stars in the offseason. Uh, NFL, of course, in full swing, getting close to playoff time for fantasy football. And uh, college basketball now off to a great start. I know my family's been keeping up with UVA, uh, having a great start to the season, maybe better than expected. Um, and college football, which uh, of course we've talked about every week, throwing soccer now. And first off, my first observation with soccer, Mike, is <laughs> I, feel just, not, I, just, I just feel like this can't go well. The, but. There is this is about soccer fandom. There is an unspoken an unspoken uh, duty amongst American men between the ages of 20 and 40, maybe to pretend that they know or care about soccer anytime the USA is playing. So every, every several years after not watching soccer for several years, there's a, there's a whole cohort that shows up and they're like wooing and going to the bars and buying jerseys of players they've never heard of before and then pretending like they're really into it. it. It's fascinating to me. Yeah. I mean, I think you bring up kind of a, you know, there, there, there's sort of an issue. Part of the reason why, you know, my interests broadly as an academic are in popular culture fandom. I tend to want to focus on sports because I think it's the most honest of the fandoms, right? I mean, Taylor Swift, who's, you know, engaged in a massive marketing operation to sell a bunch of tickets, suddenly shows up to the American Music Awards and I think takes home six trophies, right? Manufacturing. By the way, for an album that was a remake of an okay. album from maybe 10 years ago that probably well, also won American Music Awards. So she double dipped on an album and it worked. But you can almost imagine there's a negotiation of, I will show up. For no, not one award, six awards. I, I want to have more awards than I can carry, or I'm not showing up, right? So, the, like this notion of like manufactured fandom. So, when I think about the men's soccer team versus the the women's national soccer team, we know Megan Rapino. We know, uh, you know, we know, uh, you know, the names. I, Names always kind of escape the professors, but <laughs> you know, but I, I I know you know with without the pressure of the microphone and the camera, I, I can probably name five or six players on that on that team. Uh, I was just looking through some of the 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 hype for the the FIFA, and you know it, it's just not the same. the The amount of marketing effort that goes into the front end is just so vastly different that it is hard to sort of, you know, that emotional connection has to come from somewhere and it's not prepackaged in the case of men's soccer. Um, it, it's, it's an interesting, uh, look, I, I love the sport from a fandom perspective, right? It's mm -hmm. the biggest sport in the world. It's the biggest event in the world. This one seems to be kind of spectacular with some of the stories that have come out. Um, Doug, the stories I've seen, the pronunciation of Cutter, um, the possibility that there are some fake fans where they seem to be doing photo ops where they're kidding out, and that's, that's their word for jerseys, 
a group of the same men over and over again in different in different national teams. Um, and then a controversy over the fact that they're not going to sell beer. And that seems really important to the soccer hooligan culture. Right. I like the story about the fake fans being paid. I kind of like the idea of being a mercenary fan. I think that it, it might, you know, having painted up for college games, I felt like coming out of college, there should be a draft where an NFL team gets to draft like a really great fan to be on their front lines and that I would have been pretty high up in the draft with my uh, history. And so I'm like, you can get paid for this now. I know college athletes are enjoying the uh, the benefits of NIL and being like, oh, wow, we can get paid for this now. I think fans are starting to see that <laughs> with uh, the this, uh, you know, this story here. And I like the idea. I think if you're one of the agents looking for good fans, I'm ha- I'm more than happy to paint up, uh, just, you know, for the right rate, for the right team, the wrong team. I, you know, I, I would love to be a mercenary fan. Well, and look, I mean, th- the background on this FIFA event, and again, politics intrudes on every part of it, on every part of sports. It comes right? up every week. I mean, the, the Qatar FIFA event, you know, has been taking a beating in the in the press for 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 the better part of a, a decade, um, and now even there there's an LGBTQ controversy in terms of armbands that the U.S. and the U.K. team wants to wear. They will not look. You know, the, the, this old saying that uh, you know politics is downstream from the culture. No, it's all together. You know, the culture, the politics, the sports, it's all one. I'll, I'll give you another fun fact in all this, Doug, because okay. I, I, I took the time to look it up. It's fun fact to me. So the U.S. just tied Wales. The Welsh population, if you want to name a metro area that's equivalent to the population of Wales, the closest one you find is Tampa St. Pete. <laughs> that's fantastic. So if, is this, I know the bar isn't super high for U.S. men's soccer. Um, is is this a win, a moral victory, or is it? Do we feel like we kissed our sister? What's the story here? Because I've I've been to bars for U.S. men's games, doing my patriotic duty as an American man to pretend that I care about uh, American soccer, and it's like we'll tie somebody, and people are high fiving. Like, oh, that was good. Yeah, we advance now because we tied this team. Uh, is this a is this a good tie or a bad tie? Well, Doug, I'm doing my best. Okay. Um, and I believe they, the announcer said Black Friday is the U.S. versus England. So within our group, England is the big dog. Yeah, I, I think okay. England's like top five, top ten team. Uh, the U.S. and Wales were each hovering around like number nineteen, number twenty. Uh, and then I think that, and I, I think Iran is the the fourth team in there. So basically, Wales is the U.S.'s main competition to get to that next, well, to get just, to the next round. Something seems wrong, though. It seems like, you know, it seems like we're Texas, and we just tied Appalachian State in a football game, and we're ha- we're pleased, or we're not mad about that at, at the very least. It feels wrong to me. I think this is the. This is inherently why soccer uh, doesn't appeal as much to Western dudes <laughs> and, and ladies. But I feel like there is that. There's more the appeal with the U.S. women's team. Um, but yeah, it's the tying tying a team like Wales. It just doesn't do it for me, Mike. Yeah, and, and again, yeah, I'm sickened by that. <laughs> well, I'm like disgusted. I said. The U.S. tied the equivalent of playing the team from the Tampa St. Pete market. Right. It's something's, uh, I don't know. You know what? And, and maybe we should just leave that at that. We will get more into, as the U.S. team beats England on Friday, we will start to catch this wave of fandom. And we'll be wearing U.S. soccer jerseys by the time we tape the next step. You know, I thought about that. I thought I was going to come out and start with this kind of, I'm not so sure about this whole soccer thing. Uh, I mean, football. And, it, you know, if they were to actually make a run, I could see us following that for several weeks and wearing the jerseys for the final ap- episode, getting all into it. I, I do remember. I mean, I've gotten into when the, when the women's teams have been good. I've gotten into it. I think the problem is this goes back to fandom and sports. Uh, you know, kind of one of your main points about building fandom and sports is like for these NFL franchises that you study or NBA, like it always comes down to championships and winning 
And it's, it's there's it's no uh, secret as to why the Green Bay Packers have such a great fandom or, you know, are such a big fan base or the Dallas Cowboys or even more recently, the New England Patriots, the women's soccer team. They have those championships. And so they have that appeal. The men's teams like we don't know any of the players. We don't know any of their names. We They get a first or second round exit in any tournament I've ever seen them play. Uh, it probably doesn't help build fandom with guys like me. But if they went on a run and they won a World Cup. We'd all be. I suspect we'd see an explosion of fandom. We'd be naming our kids after them. Yeah, it it would be. They'd have some. There'd be some new Michael Jordan and U.S. marketing, and it'd be a a football player. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. But I'm never super optimistic about that group. But Uh, you know, but it's a fun one to watch, right? Because if they do, I mean, you can almost, you know, you can see where the narrative is going to be at, right? So. Will they, you'll start to see stories about, you know, what's it going to take for them to advance? And then stories are easy to write of, is U.S. soccer more respectable? Do we expect to get to the, I I think they call it the knockout round. Do we expect to get it to the knockout round? And if they win a game beyond that, is that when they start to actually build something? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and what does it take to, and again, sort of the fascinating thing is, what does it really take to build? I mean, the U.S. national women's team is also kind of interesting in terms of, you know, the fact that Alex Morgan and Megan Rapino that they have played, it seems like they've been around forever, right? So it's, 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 it's kind of, it's fully built out in terms of, well, okay, we get to see the, we get to see the same group again in their, in their dominant what would it take for the U.S. team, to, men's team, to actually get there? It, it seems unlikely, though. So it's kind of a pipe dream, I think. Yeah, I, it certainly feels like a pipe dream. But I'm loving the fake fan stories and seeing. Uh, if you hear anybody yelling, I'm in a house right now, and there's some folks watching soccer well, um, who haven't watched it. I mean, I suppose we could also add to this. I mean, again, this, this one goes into the head, the category that has been talked about for quite a while now of sports washing, right? Where you have a country that has essentially bad press in terms of human rights and they, you know, the Saudis start a golf league. Qatar, you know, pays big money to get the, to get FIFA to come to town. China had the Olympics, right? China had the Olympics, right? Yeah. And, and again, you know, this is the narrative in the Western press. I assume there's very different perspectives on this in the rest of the world. But, you know, there's a lot of, you know, we're talking about the U.S. men's soccer team building their brand, developing fandom. You know, what is what is Cutter's goal in all this? Right. What do they want to seen, be seen as after this? Um, Sports washing is a real thing, and you see it all the time on the individual level with athletes who, you know, if, if a ordinary citizen uh, goes and slaps a girl, a, a co-ed at Tennessee in the face, uh, after losing a football game, they're probably arrested. They're probably, you know, they're probably kicked out of school if they're a student. When it's Jermaine Burton, you know, one of Alabama's receivers, and he goes and this week, I think he had like a hundred something yards and a touchdown or two. And he's a big star. He's a big hero. And it's like, hey, he was a, you know, he was, it was a tough situation to react to. And, you know, we're able to look past that because, you know, it's, these guys are, or, you know, they deserve some forgiveness and some grace and see that all the time. We saw Ben Roethlisberger had some very cancelable stories um, and, and still probably will be a Hall of Famer who's worshipped by all of Pittsburgh for all of time. Uh, Jameis Winston had those, you know, a number of stories like that. You, the list could go on forever. Your guy, I mean, Kobe Bryant back in the Co- day. Yeah. That was, well, that was I better. thought of that. I, you know, I, I thought about that. that. Was- brutal story mm-hmm. i mean that's before your time but that was a brutal story at least in terms of and again you know i'm probably too much of a even-handed academic on some of this stuff in terms of i'm saying it was brutal in terms of the coverage i know there's passionate people on both sides of what right went down, but. yeah and i mean i think the the biggest example in in semi-recent memory has got to be penn state football right joe paterno uh, that I remember when that story broke, thinking they're gonna have to. Nobody's gonna support them anymore. No one's gonna want to be affiliated with them. No <laughs> one's gonna want to be a part of that. And it's like two years later, yeah. The whiteout, you know, they, they get a winning football team. You know, Saquon Barkley's out there, uh, oh. and I, that's not something I don't even think people's minds connect Penn State with that story anymore. 
No, I'm not going to name any names. I remember being at an academic conference <laughs> and Penn's longtime Penn State faculty, and this is like in the early days of when this was coming out, basically taking the perspective of, and, and I'm not throwing any stones because you see this everywhere. I mean, you know, fan bases are, fan bases love, they're connected to their teams. They're, they're part of the organization, right? It's almost like a family. And so when it first came out, you know, some of these Penn State faculty were like, the story is being kind of blown out of proportion, blah, blah, blah. And, and people just looking at him like, are you out of your mind? You need to run away from this one <laughs> as fast as possible. Um, I, I can take it in terms of like some of the Illinois sports scandals, which are always sort of, you know, did they pay players? Bruce Pearl yeah. says yes, blah, blah, blah. <sighs> Illinois fans are completely convinced we did not do anything wrong. And if you have a canceled check and photographic evidence, all that means is that everyone else is doing it as well, right? I mean, there, there's always that, geez, we're, <laughs> we've kind of gone out on a limb here. No, but I think it's good. I mean, we talk about sports fandom yeah. and you're getting to some of the core yeah. parts of being a fan. I feel like we need to make like a list of rules for being a fan, but there, yeah. there's kind of this unspoken list of like, your team didn't cheat. It's just if they're caught cheating, it's because everyone's cheating. Um, if your team loses, it's because the other team's cheating and your team didn't, or because the officials are bad. Um, it, you know, if someone on the other team's hurt, Doug is foreshadowing the comments of an Illinois fan in a few minutes. Yeah, yeah. Well, if if someone uh, on your team's hurt, it's a permissible excuse for a loss. If someone on the other team's hurt, they don't have enough depth. Uh, they haven't recruited. If you know, if it's college sports, they haven't recruited well enough. Uh, if it's the NFL, they haven't drafted well enough, or if it's you know, the NBA. Um, so th there's kind of these unspoken rules with sports, and I think one of them is kind of that that cheating thing where if like, if your team did something bad, it's because, well, that's what everyone's doing, and they're just doing what they have to do to keep up. Yeah, well, look, I mean, uh, you want, I mean, and, and how far does this go? I mean, I I've, I go to a lot of girls, lacrosse, girls high school lacrosse games, and I've seen the boys lacrosse team show up at Walton High School in Marietta, Georgia, and they will do their chance. If if the other team gets a little rough, you know, the, they'll have a dirty player chant. If, you know, the Walton girls get, a, you know, <laughs> two inside baseball, inside lacrosse, if Walton gets a little rough, the chant will be let them play. I mean, it, it's just, it's just automatic. It's the asymmetric relationship in terms of it's, how fans view, you know, it's, it's us versus them, right? It's us versus them. And I love I love one of my favorite examples is the NBA because there's so much uh, turnover with players. And I know like Patrick Beverly is a guy who whatever <laughs> team he plays for, the fan yeah. base adores him. Yeah. <laughs> they love him because he's scrappy, right? He's scrappy. He's a lunch pail guy. He's, uh, you know, he's he's tough. He's he'll do what it takes to win. Draymond Green, another guy like that opposing teams will say he's dirty he's yeah. you know he's cheating he's a showboat he's and and then when that player like Patrick Beverly there was a time where I think the Lakers hated him because of how he was you know going at it with them and then he ends up on the Lakers and now it's Lakers fans have to they have to contradict themselves and say hey we got this scrappy guy you know he's the kind of guy you want in playoffs he, he helps he does what it takes to win uh he's he's a team guy he's got a lot of heart a lot of hustle he's gritty you'll hear those terms from the same people. And I, I, I personally love seeing that in, uh, in professional sports. I'll give you a couple more examples, classic examples of that. Dennis Rodman, when he was on the Detroit Pistons, <laughs> yeah. was one of the dirtiest players in the league, moved over to the Chicago Bulls. Right. And what a guy, what a hustling, you know, out, high energy, high motor. Um, and I'll give you, and I'll give you he's a my, champion. Per my personal favorite in all that was, God, there was this guy, there was this coach at this basketball program, Memphis, a minor figure named John Calipari. I, I do recall. And, and the Kentucky fans, John Calipari could not have been the biggest cheater, right? Should have been banned from college basketball when he was at Memphis, moved to, you know, moved to Kentucky and completely completely forgiven instantly i always love asking fans i remember when lebron was with cleveland and i had a buddy who was a lakers fan who was a huge lebron hater and i remember asking him 
what how are you going to feel if LeBron comes to Los Angeles? Are you going to are you going to start pulling for a different team? He's like, I couldn't watch him. It would just would it would feel wrong. It would feel, and then sure enough, a couple years later, LeBron makes the transition to LA, and I I talked to him about, it and he said, well, you know, <laughs> LeBron, he's really a great player, um, and you got to respect him as a man. The, he's a father. He he started justifying everything about LeBron, and and kind of, and at this point, he's a full on. He's got the jersey. He's got so <laughs> so. There's there is this element in, in sports of, of bias that fans share unapologetically. And it's a sight to behold. Yeah, I mean, at some point we should talk a little bit about LeBron's current marketing situation where he's, you know, featured with, I guess, Aquaman playing Father Time and bringing his son into the ads. But we we can push that down the road as we get to the NBA. Okay, Doug, so one of the things we've been following closely this year is college football fandom. Yes. There was a bunch of good things this this weekend. Inexplicable things, in fact. It seems as though when it rains, it pours with these things. We'll go weeks with maybe one little story here or there, but there are some weeks where college football is just on one, and this was one of them. Uh, Mike, you sent me a video of a couple fellas uh, I was going to say brothers, but we don't know if they're in a fraternity at Texas. Uh, you just assume they are um, at Texas A&M in a semi empty stadium, swinging a towel or a shirt around. They're all shirtless and then running across the bleachers from one section to the next one empty section to the next and handing off the shirt like it's a relay race, like it's a baton. And the next guy swinging the towel and, and running from one section to the other. Do we know what was going on there? Um, Texas A&M's had a down year, I know. This was, for for a stadium that has a reputation of being one of the loudest, one of the most intimidating stadiums, man, that, that took some points away from them. 100,000 people in that stadium, I think, is a, about what the capacity. And very, I mean, they are the original 12th man. Yeah, I mean, that was yeah. always the Texas A&M thing. Uh, I think I this know. game, it looked as though they literally had a 12th man. Like, they had 11 guys on the field, and they had one guy in the, in, in the stadium, or at least in each section of the stadium. So maybe it, it was a tribute to that. I don't know. I mean, it, 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 was, it was almost, and to do it justice, it was almost like they were, you know, were they drunk? And so they were running in sort of semi-slow motion because they didn't want to fall. Was I think it that's to, a, was, an, a question we know the answer to. Were they was it be, Yeah. Was it because it was the first time they could ever really spread out in that stadium? I did some Googling on this, <laughs> and I have not found an explanation. No one has – and there probably is none, right? No one's spoken to the – the journalists did not track them down. They don't know. Oh uh, Yeah. So the whole situation in Texas a now, coming into the season, I think they were top five. I know they were top ten team. Number one recruiting class in the country. Beat Alabama last year. You know, here's something I've noticed, Mike. If a team beats Alabama, yeah. they not only do they get overranked or overhyped, like their status is elevated. Old, years back, it was Ole Miss upset. Like the bottom line is, every year Alabama seems to play a game on the road where they just become a bad football team. And what you know, if it's Ole Miss, all of a sudden Ole Miss is in the top five, and the next season they're preseason top tens. They beat Alabama last year, and they have some returning players. This year it was Tennessee um, at home beating Alabama, and you know, it turns out they weren't as good. But last year was Texas A and M, where you know it was kind of like okay, they beat Alabama, and this year they've got returning players, they got the same coaching staff, they're going to be great, and mm-hmm. you know they get this big recruiting class. They're not going to make a bowl game. Uh, I don't know how Jimbo Fisher stays there. I don't know what I know that fan base is very cultish, and I think that's a word that a lot of people use that have been around them. Everyone I speak to in Texas, when I say, What's Texas AM like? They say it's like a cult. <laughs> it's the first thing they'll say every time. Um, I, you know, I, I imagine it's probably those guys finding a way to have fun in the midst of a pretty brutal season. And I, you got to tip your hat to that. I, I appreciate a fan who can. Um, still enjoy themselves despite massive disappointments in a season like this. Yeah, no, I, I mean, and what a visual they created, right? I mean, what a visual. Yeah, it was, I think that the that beats like the paper bag over the head. That used to be my favorite way of showing 
Uh, you know, we're not very proud of our team, but I think having one fan in each section of the stadium and, and what's supposed to be one of the most daunting places to play in college football shirtless, uh, maybe not the most impressive physiques across the board, uh, but proud uh, nevertheless. And but perfect physiques for what they were doing. Exactly. Right? Perfect, perfect, perfect representations of a, a fan base that's trying to make the most out of a, a tough situation. But in that same game, Mike, we had another another instance, another fandom situation that I uh, appreciated. We had prior to the game, two opposing players in the end zone on one knee um, praying, <laughs> I assume, praying or giving tribute to a loved one. I don't know. Something probably serious or, or meaningful to them. Unfortunately for them, they're in front of like a smoke cannon. Uh, I'm just I guess like, Texas A&M shot a cannon at these guys. <laughs> And, and the fans were cheering it on. You can hear the audio in the video. Someone said, that was awesome. Uh, man, that was... I think the 12th man is whoever's got the button yeah. for the cannons. That guy is... He's on the lookout. He's, stay, you know, he's, looking for, <laughs> he's looking for an opposing player within sight so he can shoot that fog cannon at him. I enjoyed that. And, and that's one of my favorite things in college football is that we can have a game that doesn't really matter. I, I don't even know who Texas A&M was playing this week, but it's like Texas A&M's been out of contention, and yet they can have two of my favorite stories from the whole week because there's always something unpredictable, uh, particularly with fans. One unpredictable thing with fans that happened this week was the USC UCLA game, which is a heck of a let game, me, by the way. Let me just put a point on on Texas yeah, A&M yeah. because you know, in some ways, you know, Texas A&M is, you, you described them as cultish, which I think is perfect, right? Yeah. But they've always been number two in that state after Texas Austin. And so it, there, it's also kind of a fascinating story where we finally had an opportunity to see the Clippers surpass the Lakers or to see the Mets surpass the Yankees. Nets, Knicks, you know, yep. These amazing kind of recruiting classes seemingly on a run now playing in the big leagues of the sec while texas is still back in in the big 12 and it just collapsed on them right and so does it, it not happen every time with these franchises i can't tell you how many times in my life the nets will have a stacked i mean they do right now they'll have a stacked roster and like when they acquired when they when they ended up with a roster with James Harden, Kevin Durant, and Kyrie Irving, I think everyone just assumed, yeah, like yeah, they're going to win a championship. And do they? We talked about it on the podcast maybe a year or two ago. Do they now supplant the Knicks as New York's team once they win a championship or several championships? It's like it doesn't matter what players are on your team if you're that second team in a city. Good luck winning anything of significance. It's like the sports gods just will not allow it to happen. We've seen it with Texas A&M. We've seen it with the Clippers a million times. And, of course, the Nets. I'm sure there's other examples I could point to uh, across sports. But it's, well, it's and, an and interesting sadly, phenomenon to me. And sadly, A&M's window is about to close, right? As Texas comes way. into the SEC. Yeah. It's, it's, this, was know, this was their shot. This was their shot. This was their shot. So, um, But I was saying, USC, UCLA, heck of a football game. Battle for Los Angeles. Pac-12, uh, I guess, championship spot at stake, potentially. And we had a fan on the field. And it wasn't Bobby Wagner this time. No, it was a security guard who laid a hit stick on him. Um, I have a theory that I, I think we need to do a where are they now on like all of the guys who were like safeties and linebackers Probably back before, before there were targeting penalties. Because I think they're all security guards of these football games now. Yeah, you know the my takeaway from that one is I think you know so the, I I'm gonna just gonna guess that the security guard was the guy in yellow right that they're sort of camp field security and then there's off duty cops right and you notice that the off duty cop got outrun to, to and then the security guy got the hit and it was like the they should have thrown a flag on the off duty cop because he took a shot. After the guy was down, it was a late it hit. Was, it was a it was little a late hit. Fantastic. Unnecessary roughness. Um, you know, cops have a history of of unnecessary roughness and getting away <laughs> with that. So it's unfortunate, though. The ref was right there. Official was right there, and you know, I think if you were able to review, Do we know penalties, what the podcast was about on that one. No, and you know, I wish I did because normally it's something fun like animal rights or. So, so well, some 
something irrelevant to football. And, and, you know, I don't know if you can, you know, my favorite, wasn't it early on, was it an LSU fan that just came and stood like on the five yard line? Yeah. He was just watching the game. Yeah. You know, he wanted that front row. I think now, you know, they have those VR headsets and you can sit anywhere in the stadium with those when you watch. And I think he might've been used to watching football that way. Do you think there's more of that this year? It seems like we've seen more of these hits, maybe because of the protests. And then maybe there's always a natural level of I'm going to run on the field kind of behavior. But this year, because of, you know, protesting of this or that, we've kind of doubled or tripled the numbers. Yeah. And hey, I'm here for it, man. It, it, yeah. Everything. Yeah, I can't find um, I can't find any info on what inspired this person to run onto the field. So I don't know. They did, you know, they didn't have a like a little uh, smoke bomb with pink smoke coming out like that one guy at the Rams game. So uh, you know, I don't know if it, this one doesn't seem to be a gender reveal or anything of that sort. I think, I think every, I think every American man deep down in their their soul, they have a longing to to do that just once. And so these guys. I always envy them a little bit. I say that tongue in cheek, of course, but I do think, yeah, have you ever been in a game and you're just standing there and you're like, am I, am I about to run onto the field? Is this going to happen? Well, like, no, I probably shouldn't. Again, it'd be interesting if there were stats on this. I mean, Tennessee obviously, you know, rushed the field after Alabama. Right. And he tore down the goalposts. I, I think there were a couple more, right? I think Vanderbilt rushed the field because they beat Florida. Right. South Carolina rushed the field against yeah. Tennessee this week. Yeah. I mean, it's, and and the fines are my understanding is the fines seem sort of randomly distributed of this is a hundred thousand or this is two hundred thousand. But they've it's, up the ante and the SEC for they've they've upped the fines you, this year. It has not been effective. A, as a spike squad member, did you ever rush the field? Nope. Georgia it's not something that happens there. Uh hasn't happened. And I don't know that they've like I think even if when I was a student, if we'd beaten Alabama, I don't think it would have happened. Um, so it, I don't know. Some schools it lend themselves better to it. I think when you're not expected to be as successful as Georgia is, it, it's a little bit different. Like Georgia to me is like, you know, I'm biased, but I mean, I, I truly think Georgia's kind of like a. It's like if UNC or Duke fans rush the court in basketball, like that'd be kind of silly. <laughs> it doesn't matter who they're playing. They, just, they you don't really do that when you're UNC or Duke. And, you know, of course, Georgia doesn't have the history of either of those programs, but in recent memory, and I think the expectations with their recruiting advantages and stuff is that they should be where they are. And so to rush the field would be a little bit embarrassing. Yeah. Um, so last story uh, with, with college fans. This is a first for me. I've never seen this before. An Arkansas, I'm assuming student, but an Arkansas fan appeared to have stolen the helmet of an Ole Miss football player and runs up the stadium, the, the, you know, up to the concourse holding his, his helmet. And this, uh, Ole Miss football player comes into the stands and I was, you know, they were very close to having a malice at the palace type situation where you got player versus fans duking it out in the crowd. Of course, the fan was armed with a helmet. The player was padded. It would have been quite interesting to watch. Um, and I think security ran the guy down. I don't know, but some of the fans were cheering for the guy to run away with the helmet. I mean, they were cheering for oh, him to commit a crime. Of, of are you sure? Are you sure? Because I, I read through a lot of t- responses on Twitter to that video. Okay, and some of the questions were, did he get away? I mean, look, this is a this is a Twitter source, so it means absolutely nothing. But I did see something that some f- tweets that said, yeah, he got away. So I I have no with idea. If not. Yeah, I, I mean. I saw that the security ran after him, but I, so, I mean, maybe he did, but I, you know, if you list that on eBay, you're putting yourself at risk. So I don't know what he's going to do with the helmet. Um, <laughs> is oh, he, he's got to get the player to sign it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know. You know, it's going to be great next year or two years from now. If, if uh, Ole Miss returns to Arkansas and there's one Arkansas fan in the crowd with an Ole Miss helmet on and an <laughs> Arkansas Jersey and be like, that's the guy. That's the guy we got him, but everyone else would have forgotten about it. But yeah, it's, I will say this, some of these fans, they're a little bit, I don't think they understand who they're messing with sometimes. Like these guys are, I know it's fun, like to hackle players and stuff. You start stealing stuff or hitting them or doing anything that's like, you know, could be considered a crime. 
I think you're endangering yourself. We saw it. I mean, we saw it already. Like I mentioned earlier with Jermaine Burton hitting the young lady at the Tennessee game. Uh, and of course not being punished because of sports washing, which I love that term, by the way, Mike, did you coin that? Or is that, has that been a term? That's, that's been out there for, okay. I'm just behind on such yeah. things, but yeah, due to sports washing. Um, yeah, I, you know, I don't think that the frat boy at, uh, Arkansas would have, would have felt good about his decision had he come within five feet of the Ole Miss football player. Well, look, I, the, I mean, the sad thing is the, okay. So as that's going down, I a hundred percent get the fans in the crowd actually even like inadvertently getting in the way of the security, right? Helping <laughs> the guy on the getaway. I, I get that mentality. It's like, that's, that's automatic. Part of me wonders sure. in this day and age of facial recognition, are they going to find this guy? Did they get well, clear enough they, video easily, from they, Twitter? And then, you know, like every, I mean, think about where fa- facial recognition is everywhere. You know, you do yeah. a self out at a target and you're in a database that's linked to your name now, right? I mean, you, the brother's were, watching. Yeah, there were literally, like, <laughs> you know, it was one of the funniest things during COVID, right? You had to stand and take, you know, facial recognition for the digital temperature check, right? These things are all in databases. And so does law enforcement go after this kid in this but, crime of passion? But this is where it gets real interesting. What if law enforcement, it's it's in Fayetteville, Arkansas. What if law enforcement are Arkansas fans? I mean, it's the same guys that are probably standing in the way of security. I don't know that they're looking into this one. Um, Doug, a crime, a crime committed... <laughs> in front of a hundred thousand people is you know it, it's peak fandom in a way right it's, i'd love to see the fbi get involved with this i'd love to see the local police not do their job and, and go to a federal level and let's make this <laughs> let's make this a big deal let's get the president talking about it um let's have the you know for the next election let's have this be a talking point and things that are debated as to how it would have been handled i'd love to see that with sports and politics intertwining once again um, yeah, so my, I guess my takeaway from all of this is that it seems like fans, you mentioned earlier, it seems like there's been more people on the field. There's like a rising, maybe it's with the younger generation, the audacity of fans is increasing. And whether it's, you know, maybe it stems from the things being on Twitter and being able to directly attack players and insult them and meme them and toy with them. And taking that to the next level with, you know what, I you know, I can say whatever I want to this guy. We had a little back and forth on Twitter. So, yeah, I can. What, what if I steal his helmet? That'll be like the next level. I just think the audacity of fans is getting to a point where at some point we're going to have a malice at the palace type situation uh, because I think players aren't too happy about it. Bobby Wagner taking out that fan was a perfect example. Um, and, of course, like I said, I've mentioned a couple of times Jermaine Burton. And I think this whole Miss player probably, if he'd gotten within five feet, probably wasn't going to show a lot of mercy to the Arkansas fan. Well, and you know, here's the sad truth in all this: it might actually be rational behavior. Like I, I suspect, <laughs> I suspect that this younger gen, look, the younger generation, and, and like I am not one of these guys that's like, oh, the younger generation's weak, participation trophies, blah blah. blah. But I do think, you know, as you get younger, there's been more of an emphasis on essentially safety, right? This idea of the safe space of always making sure that people are all right and mental health. And I think that does tend to put people in a bubble. Now you add to that and sort of put next to that, the fact that, and this is, I think the, the scary part of this story, it might be a rational move to commit these crimes publicly or this foolishness publicly, right? These guys at Texas A&M, for example, to take a really benign example, if they had been the ones posting their their relay ra- race with the T-shirt, and that goes r- viral, then suddenly they've got a viral video, right? They've got 10 million hits on that. They've got the social cachet that that comes from that. In some ways, the same thing with that that kid stealing the helmet. Suddenly, these are suddenly th- they're content creators. It, it's, Harvey, it's Harvey Updike. Song. Harvey Updike in the modern day, uh, for those that aren't aware, Harvey Updike, the gentleman who poisoned Auburn's oak tree that is rolled after every big win, the Alabama fan who poisoned the Auburn tree and became somewhat of a celebrity 
amongst Alabama fans and, of course, public enemy number one in Auburn, Alabama, in the Opelika region. Uh, in today's day and age, he could have become an influencer. He could have become. He could have cashed in basically nil money from that. I mean, I, I'm of course, I'm exaggerating, but there is kind of this. I'll tell you this. I've I have heard. I won't say specifics. I've heard of fans at the college level being compensated via endorsements due to their massive social followings as super fans, and that's really? a thing. Yeah, nil has has trickled into the Does fandom world. Sp- I'd have an you know have an endorsement deal yet. Your I have heard I have heard murmurs so that you know don't write this down. But I've heard murmurs that there there's some kind of uh, some kind of arrangement uh, with with some students who aren't athletes, kind of profiting in the way that student athletes are. So uh, you know who's to say that helmet guy doesn't become a meme and you know start a TikTok and. Gets all of the Arkansas Hog Nation behind him and cashes out with some barbecue endorsements or something. Or where, where's the Ole Miss helmet over? You know, while he's eating some barbecue on a commercial and and makes some money off of it. It's it's a it's a changing landscape in fandom as it is with college athletics. Yeah, you mentioned Auburn and uh, Auburn and Alabama in passing there, right? It's uh, that's where we're at now. We're in rivalry week, yeah, right? We are. And this is, in some ways, in some ways, this is like what we play the whole season for. It's almost like there are three events in college football, right? We play the whole season to get to rivalry week, the conference championships, and then the college football playoffs. Yeah, I, I want to make this point. First off, Michigan Ohio State is like that's the rivalry game of all time, potentially, potentially a playoff spot on the line. Although it's possible that both teams make the playoff at that point, it won't mean all that much. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, Michigan has, is a one loss team, so it's not that big of a deal anymore. So you want to, do you need to talk no, about that? No, I, I, that's as far as I want to take it. Okay. Um, <laughs> just, I'm here for you. <laughs> um, yeah. So college football, first things first, like big picture, Four college football playoff teams is enough. I'll say it. Twelve playoff teams would make Tennessee's loss this last week meaningless. Alabama's losses to Tennessee and uh see what else they lose to. Oh, LSU meaningless. Like all these teams would be in. I don't know. I kind of like it at four. I feel like there's not more than four good teams. There's you a possibility. The, well, so you want the radio season to matter, right? I like it mattering. I think it's fun. I think that's what differentiates it. Like, I love the NBA. It's really hard to be that invested in any single NBA game because it's like they play 82 of them. They're going to and like if you're good, you're going to make I'm even like that. Not a lot of people are like this. I'm like that with college basketball. I'll turn on a game. I think last week there was a game. It was like Michigan State versus Duke or something. And I kind of shrugged it off. It's like, yeah, like they'll both be in the tournament. It doesn't really matter. Just they, if they turn it on at the right time, they can win it all. This game isn't going to affect. It could affect the difference in them being the two seed or the three seed. Um, you know, I don't know how big a difference that makes. And so I like, yeah. I think that makes college football special. I think it's a good observation. And, and as we have, as you say, this it's probably the only sport where the regular season still matters. Yeah. I mean, and, to and the, so, definitely to the level that it does because there's yeah. so few games. And so the idea of moving away from that strikes me as potentially a big mistake on the part of college football, right? It's, you know, in some ways, college basketball, that tournament is their season now. Yep. College football all 11, 12 weeks matter, right? I mean, every week matters. All weeks matter, as they yeah. say. And uh, I, I, you know, well, you I know think what, Michigan, like, Ohio State this week, if it's a 12 team oh, playoff, does it really let's matter? Mention, let's mention one number, right? And remember, Georgia, Tennessee drew 13 million people, which was more than the World Series game, right? right? So, so those folks out there that want to say, you know, the money's in the playoffs. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, right? You you kind of cheapen, the, you know, in that that number of thirteen million people, that's probably, you know, three times what's going to watch an average NBA playoff game. Yep. So you know, you know, think it through, college football, in terms of you, before you start to go that far in that direction, where, you know, the LSU's and the Tennessees and the Alabamas would still have a would still have a shot at this, right? Maybe yeah. it kind of sucks for those fan bases, I but just, I just think it cheapens. The- I think it cheapens the regular season. I think the regular season, I think, it, like you said, it's the one sport where the regular season really is special. And I think it has that playoff atmosphere in the middle of October or September. 
Um, and I think that's you don't you don't get that in any other sport. And I think that's part of why we see all the craziness we see in college football. And you saw it, you know, this week with South Carolina getting to knock Tennessee out of the picture. That's a game that probably doesn't matter. I mean, Tennessee's they're number eight or something like that now. They're still in the playoff in, in a 12 team or 18 playoff. They're still in the playoff. They're, you know, they still get the revenge game with Georgia. They probably get a rematch with Alabama at some point. Who, by the way, it's like teams like Alabama are able to go a whole season, only beat their cupcakes, not beat a single impressive opponent, and still make the playoff. And if they just turn it on for like three or four weeks, uh, their national champions. I don't like that. Like I don't I don't think that's rewarding to a team like TCU who has gotten the job done all year uh, to this point of course or or a team you know teams like Georgia or Ohio State you know or Michigan who have who have been great all year. It doesn't reward the team that has the best season. It's you know the team with oh, talent Michigan, it turns it on all, at the end Michigan of the season. Michigan has been great all year. Say what? Michigan hasn't been great all year. Well, yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah. and, and to be honest, Georgia hasn't either. And, and I say the same about Ohio State if you look at their week to week. But they've gotten the job done. They've won the games that they've needed to win. Well, Alabama hasn't done that. Tennessee okay. hasn't done that. Michigan needed a lot of help. Okay. <laughs> we'll just say that. Michi- Michigan, uh, yeah. So are you pulling against Michigan for a Ohio State game? Do you feel like that would avenge it somehow? Or do you think it's too late for that? Yeah, I mean, like Doug, this is rivalry week. So, uh, you know, we, we look. We as fans, fans love their teams. They are one with their teams. The other side of this, you know, it's it's Batman and the Joker kind of thing. Mm-hmm. There will always be teams that fan bases despise, and it's entirely a positive, right? So, we're I, I've been alluding to the fact that there were some very questionable calls in terms of Illinois versus Michigan. The idea of beating Michigan at the big house for Illinois, wow, that is spectacular. Now, you, yeah. you ask me, you know, if, if I'm giving you a short list of the teams that I love to beat as a as a as an Illinois guy, yeah, it, it's Indiana and basketball, it's Iowa and basketball, it's Michigan and football. I mean, and look, you're a Georgia guy, Doug. Who do you want to beat more than anything in, in any given year? Is it Auburn? Is it you know Florida? I mean, there, there's a lot of good candidates, but I know that you. I know some of them mean more than others. Let's say that they absolutely do. So I'm just curious for a Illinois football fan. You guys are going to make the the Big Ten championship, right? No, no, no they were out on a three game losing streak. Yeah, oh, bummer. Because I was thinking. You know, Michigan wins this week, get a rematch, but I lost track of <laughs> yeah. it's a you know, the Big Ten is a little interesting because you got one division that has Ohio State, Michigan, and Penn State in it, and another division where it's it's kind of always up for grabs. Um yeah. so yeah, it's, it's still Mike, I'm like I said, I know you said you don't want to talk, but it's Michigan. a division that's gonna get very strained with conference realignment with you're gonna have suddenly USC and UCLA in the same division with Wisconsin, you know, these kind of farm schools. Yeah. But, you know, that's beauty. You know, strange times ahead. Strange times ahead. Um, college football, though, a lot of interesting potential scenarios right now. First off, uh, another observation is that Tennessee has been jumped in the rankings by Alabama. Both teams are 9-2. and two. Tennessee has the the win, the head to head win and they're ranked behind Alabama. That's in the AP poll right now. So I've heard clamoring for, you know, Oh, Alabama's going to sneak into the playoff. I don't see how that's really possible. Um, no chance. This is, yeah, the, this is I think the year that uses the example that not, you know, that it's a fair playing field. Alabama doesn't get, this is the year, right? Where it's like, there's right. one SEC team at this point. So Ohio state and Michigan play each other this week. One of them's going to inevitably lose that game. It's not soccer. Um, no ties and Georgia and LSU are going to play each other. If, if Georgia wins, LSU's out. If LSU wins, they're probably both in so that, you know, that's in two weeks. That's going to, I don't think so. I I don't think LSU, I don't think a two loss LSU. Look, I think I, I suspect this is going to be the year when the big 10 gets two teams. I think Michigan does that render this week's Ohio state Michigan game more or less meaningless. You know how this is. You you grew up in Alabama. Is that is the Iron Bowl ever meaningless? Right. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah. TCU seems to be 
hanging on by a thread every week, as is USC. USC's got Notre Dame this week, and Notre Dame has been hot mm-hmm. as of late. After a really rough start to the season, they've been on fire. And I, you know, I'll say it, I, I kind of expect them to win that game uh, against USC in in uh, Los Angeles. And so another game to keep an eye on. And then the one team that I do think has a shot to creep into the picture under the right circumstances that everyone wrote off is Clemson. Because you look at TCU and the way they've been playing, uh, how fortunate they are to be in the position that they're in. I think it's very possible they lose either Iowa State or a Big 12 championship. USC, I think it's very possible they lose Notre Dame or a Pac-12 championship. I think it's very possible LSU loses to Georgia, or even if they win, uh, that they you know wouldn't make the playoff, like you were saying. And that next team is Clemson, sitting at ten and one. They've got South Carolina this week, a South Carolina team that just whipped up on Tennessee. So all of a sudden, you know, if, from a resume standpoint, that's maybe a more impressive win if Clemson's able to pull it out. I don't know that they will, but if they are, and if they go win uh, the ACC championship against UNC. Who's you got a quarterback who's had you know drawn a lot of attention this year and has had a great season, and you're looking at a situation where Georgia's in, winner of Ohio State, Michigan's in, uh, that TCU's next team, in. yeah, well TCU in this, you know, they may or may not win out, but they could be in or they could be one loss. I think if they're one loss, they're out. Uh, I think if USC loses another game, they're out. And so Clemson's kind of that next team, and and it could be like a conference champ, one loss Clemson versus like a one loss Michigan or Ohio State vying for that final playoff spot. Um, well, pretty- I, I I tend to think at this moment, at this moment, the Big Ten gets to Georgia, TCU, and the Big Ten, but I don't know if. The- but like I said, if TCU loses, who's that next team? But, USC. But if we know, well, but we if we know anything about college football there's gonna something's gonna happen it's gonna yeah. get a little weird right there's a, there's a level of unpredictability in college football that can and we yeah. saw it this last week tennessee i don't know that anyone yeah. expected them to to lose certainly not in the fashion that they did against the south carolina team that looks horrible the week before um and, and you know they went from being some people's favorites for a national champion to completely eliminated from the playoff that happened to alabama earlier this year and so now with just one week left of the season and then conference championships, it's like, okay, let's, I feel like something always happens in the big 12 that eliminates their team. And with it being TCU and the way that they're playing, I'm just like, something always happens. Uh, I don't know who exactly they're going to play in the big 12 championship, but I am keeping an eye on them. They barely escaped a, a pretty bad Baylor team on Saturday. Um, as did, I guess, USC, you know, escaped a, a decent UCLA team. And now USC's got a tougher opponent, I believe, against uh, Notre Dame. So wild times, but it's. Well, I think I think that like college football, wild, right? Say you what? Know, about to get wild, right? Something, something will go down. I think that Georgia, Ohio State, Michigan, USC would mm-hmm. feel it would feel like four elite teams, but there, there's certain it ends up being like Georgia, oh, Michigan, three elite, three elite teams in Michigan. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, because they're one loss to Illinois. Uh, Georgia, Michigan, TCU, and USC, or Georgia, Michigan, TCU, Clemson, or Georgia, Michigan, USC, Clemson. Those those scenarios, I think Georgia fans like myself would love to see, um, but it it probably would feel a little bit fluky that some of those teams slide in there. Uh, Yeah, if Ohio State's eliminated, it'd be pretty crazy for two years in a row for how good they've been to not make the playoffs. So uh, okay. we'll, we'll see what happens on Saturday. Doug, I'm looking at the clock and I'm happy that, you know, I've been a lot of time on sort of fandom fundamentals, rivalries, fans out of control. Let me say something real quick about the NFL. And then we can talk a little bit about some, some interesting things. Again, the world of finance invades sports, you Great. know, of, of all yes. things. the NFL, Top six quarterbacks by yards thrown. Okay. I spent a lot of time thinking about quarterbacks. Top six Patrick Mahomes, number one. Josh Allen, number two. Joe Burrow, number three. Tom Brady, number four. Justin Herbert, number five. Aaron Rodgers, number six. Maybe quarterbacks analysis is the simplest thing possible. <laughs> You know, with all the trouble that's gone down for some of these guys over the course of the season, 
that to me is a remarkable list. Yeah. And if I go to by touchdown passes, the the top the top five are Mahomes, Burrow, Allen, Rogers, and Tua. <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Tua. And Tua's missed some games, yeah. so he might with yardage, he might be up there too. Uh, if you did on a per game basis, but I, as a fantasy football guy, I always expect for players like Joe Burrow or Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, I just expect a regression to mean. I think early in the season, all three of those guys got off to a little bit of a rough start, and mm-hmm. that's where I was. I was like, all right, how you know, let's acquire these guys because their value's down right now, and it's almost inevitable that they're going to, unless they get hurt, they're going to make it up over the course of the season, and that's what yeah, we've I- seen. You know, the, with more data, with more experience, it's like the the talent comes through, right? I mean, yeah. th- those lists are those are if you were building a team, those are the guys you would want to have, right? Those are essentially the top five, the top five quarterbacks. Yeah. Okay, Doug. Last thing on the agenda, and you know, we we talked about this briefly. Maybe you looked it up. Where and again, kind of trivia question: Where do the Pittsburgh Steelers play? They play at Heinz Field. Yeah. So the Pittsburgh Steelers now play at, I'm not even sure how to pronounce it, Acrisure, which is an insurance company field. Not the same. Uh, not the same. Not the same. Where do, and, and the reason why this is, this is top of mind is because there's been a crypto, you know, it's been all over the news in terms of the collapse of FTX. And part of it, part of the story is that FTX had the naming rights for the Miami basketball arena. Do you know Which, who, do you know who, they, who the, the arena was named for before FTX? I believe it was American Airlines. It was American Airlines. Yeah, yeah and, the crypto exchange is getting arenas because I know that crypto.com has... Uh, the, the old Staples Center, and when Celsius went down earlier this year, another big crypto exchange, it crossed my mind. Well, what if that happens to Crypto.com and they, you know, they they own this arena, they own the naming rights for for such a big sports now, arena. You and I grew up in different eras, right? When I was uh, when I was a kid, you know, and you know the the ballparks were named, and some of these are still named, right? Fenway Park. It was Shea Stadium. It was the 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 Lakers played at the Forum. Yeah, uh, it was Boston Garden, Madison Square Garden. You know, based on based on the address, the Bears played in Soldier Field. <clears throat> you know, the, 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 but these teams have now in, and, and so as a kid, you know, it, it's almost like these these arenas have like a. You know, they're, they almost have like a, a religious significance, right? They're, they're like the modern day cathedral, right? Yeah. This is where the thing that I love the most, where they play. We're now on, I think, generation two or generation three in some cases of the corporate sponsored arena. And Doug, I hate it. It feels like it cheapens the product. I remember when even, yeah. I mean, SunTrust Park was a new park for the Atlanta Braves, but when it became Truist Park... Braves fans did not like that at all. They did not no, like that. It, there's no, you know, and, and all I can think is that in some ways the the arena or the stadium was part of the team's tar, part of the team's brand, part of the yep. team's legacy. And, and by selling off the names, it's like they're no longer, let's say, building the, you know, I mean, like the idea is like you know, Michael Jordan was playing in Chicago, was winning championships in Chicago stadium and there's magic in this building. But then you throw a corporate sponsor on that and then that corporate sponsor disappears and you get the next one in there and they destroy any equity being attached to that arena. See, I don't like, I talked last week about how I don't like the NBA city edition uniforms. I don't like having the brand on the uniform. Like it's NASCAR. I don't like seeing Oh, especially, yeah, yeah, especially when it's like not, you know, if it's Gatorade or something athletic related at least, but if it's like a paper count, you know, if you got Dunder Mifflin on your jerseys <laughs> and you're you're not the Scranton basketball team, um, it's it's just kind of jarring to me and it feels cheap and corporate and uh, I, I don't like it. I, I don't like it as a consumer um, and these stadium names, like you said, it's, I mean, imagine your college team, imagine like as a Georgia guy, imagine if Sanford Stadium became you know 
I'm trying to think of a company, but he's barbecue stadium. And then, and then three years later, it becomes American express stadium. Right. And then five years later, it becomes, you know, the Chevy Tahoe field at the, you know, at the, at the FTX stadium, right. It's Bitcoin arena. Um, it, it, it cheapens the, tra- you know, and again, I don't think, you know, I think when you look back historically, what these naming deals were worth, it, it seems like it was, these were about $2 million deals per year. If you go back to the turn of the century, now there may be 15 to $20 million a year things, but it's definitely, there's a cost to it that I don't think the sports industry is, you know, maybe they think about it, but they'd just rather have the money and then pretend right. that it doesn't exist, that it's going to be someone else's problem. But, you know, look, that, Georgia, Sanford Stadium, that means something to Georgia fans? Oh, yeah. Okay. That means something then uh, Sharpie Stadium when they, you know, they, they switch over to a, a, a pen based brand. I mean, all right. Okay. We're, I, I, uh, I I'm sickened by the thought of that and Sharpie Stadium at uh, Bitcoin Field in Athens, Georgia. Well, and, and I suspect Count me out. One of the, well, I suspect one of the things that's going on, like with the Chicago Bears. So the Chicago Bears seem to be in a bit of a fight with the the city of Chicago with threats to move out to where where the old horse racing. I think it was Arlington Parks where you used to go bet on the on the ponies. That I suspect part of that deal is the bears play at soldiers field, mm-hmm. right? I think it's very difficult to take something called soldiers field and put the logo of FTX on top of it. Right. You know, that's, but if you move, then suddenly I think you go, Hey, now we got a $20 million a year revenue stream. And that's what makes that deal, you know, so attractive, but yeah. I think even when you go from one brand to another brand, like I think the Staples Center is a classic example where Lakers fans, Staples Center became part of the Lakers brand, you know, and the Staples, I mean, I don't think that people are fans of Staples, but Staples Center, that was an iconic arena to them, much like Oracle Arena um, for the Golden State Warriors moving to the Chase Center and Staples Center becoming Crypto.com Arena. LA people hate that. They do not See, like, they won't call it, they'll still call it the Staples Center. They don't I like I think you're picking up on something that's kind of key in this. It's what it is when you're a kid, like during your formative years. <laughs> when, yeah, right? because, during your formative years. Because no one, you know, Wrigley Field is one of the classic ballparks in all of sports. And that was, you know, I assume that was named for the chewing gum magnet, right? right. It, it, that was the original deal. But, you know, the, those brands. So, I mean, maybe you can get away with the brand name if you do it, you know, Acrisure or FTX. I, you know, I don't know that that's ever going to work. But if you do it kind of subtly and you leave it in place, then I think it can work out fine. I think so, too. With that, we'll wrap things up. As always, much more content at www. You don't even need that anymore, do you? How many do W's you? are there? Yeah, at fandomanalytics.com for more content.